And now this is a simple algebra to solve this equation. 18 minus 32 is negative 14. And what did you get as the acceleration? A thousand. Right, positive or negative? Negative, negative. And the units should come out correctly. Does it make sense that the acceleration should be negative? Yeah, we would have predicted that up front. If this had not come out negative, we would have known we made an algebra mistake, and we could go back and check that. All right, and then what should I do with this number? Well, I should immediately go back and put it into our overall framework. So here we have our negative 1,000 meters per second squared. And now, as we've discussed, we can bring this number down here. I think this is the, excuse me, I think this is the only number we can bring down, right? The only number, oh, besides the initial velocity, we can bring down the acceleration. Because the acceleration is coming from the snow in both cases. Okay, good. Now what? You can use the x squared equals vi squared plus 2ax. Right. Now we have three numbers. Once we have three numbers, we're ready to use a kinematics equation. So let's work that out. Before we work that out, let's just do a little bit of predicting. Remember, we're supposed to try to predict the answer. What can we predict about delta x here? It has to be larger than the, the original. Yeah, it's got to be bigger than 0.35 meters. So it's a good habit to get into to try to make a prediction. Well, we know we should be getting something bigger than 0.35 meters. So we want to pick the equation that's missing time. The equation that is missing time is v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2a delta x. v final is 0. v initial is our positive 32. So what did you end up with for delta x? 51.27 meters. Yeah. Good. It came out as 0.512 meters, but maybe we should put that into centimeters since that's what we were given in the original problem. So that's a good habit to put that back into centimeters. <laughs> and does that match our prediction? Uh, yeah, that does match our prediction. That's bigger than the 35 centimeters over here. By the way, mathematically, did this come out positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Is that what we would expect? Yes. Yeah. If it came out negative, we would have known we made a mistake. So displacements can be positive and negative as well. OK. Well, I think we can learn some stuff from this problem. Like I said, this is pretty um, typical of what you're going to see on the exams. Multi-part problems. Now, the first part here didn't give you much difficulty. However, because maybe we weren't quite as systematic as we could have been there, um, that might have helped hurt us on this part. I think now you can see what I meant when I said that we're using these five variables as kind of the framework for our approach. Write down the five variables and use that as your framework. One thing I didn't mention before, though, is that if the problem has multi-parts, you might need to do this more than once because the initial and final points change. So when you change the initial and final points, you need to rewrite the variables all over again. And then one key thing for a multi-part problem is to ask which numbers change between the parts and which numbers stay the same. The big number that, um, so the big mistake that I think we were making at the start was trying to carry this time along. Well, we can't carry the time along. What we can carry is the acceleration. 
We also saw what to do once you know all four, once you know four variables. Once you know four variables, you can use any equation you want, except for the one that's missing the variable that you care about. So it was pretty easy to find this acceleration. They never asked us for this acceleration, but we still needed it to go on to part B. That make sense? Okay. So that's our more systematic approach, and also we saw how important it was to keep extending the picture as the problem went on and changing the initial and final points.